Out of the street corners they scream. You knew it was coming. You've been waiting for this for months. Rumor hardened into fear and now they scream at you. The sirens, their hysterical wail tearing through the white noise of the city. And you run. You run to pick up those things that can never be replaced. A picture of them in the days when they still loved you. Your mother's wedding ring. And then you turn to your shelf of games. You only have room for five. Five games for Doomsday. Five Games for Doomsday is a show in which board game personalities are thrust into a cabin in the woods to outrun an oncoming disaster, but can only take five of their games with them. But which will they choose? My guest this week sits slap bang in the centre of the hobby. A former video game programmer, in the year 2000 he launched what has been called a resource without peer for board and card gamers, the recognised authority of this online community. This is, of course, Board Game Geek the indispensable tool that is used by hobbyist, professional, casual gamer and grognard alike. My guest this week is Scott Alden. Scott, welcome to yes. the cabin. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Does anyone call you Scott or does everyone call you Aldi? My wife calls me Scott. <laughs> so to begin then, my first question is, how difficult was it for you to choose the five games to take to the cabin? It's actually not too hard. I was... I was tormented by it when you when you first sent the email and i'm like oh and then i just when i actually sat down to think about it I, it came very quickly and uh, i just had to think through the you know the past 20 years and pick what i what i wanted to bring and it they just kept coming and i'm like oh now i have six so which one do i take out you know like that kind of that was i was at that point and so what sort of criteria did you use was it simple practicality um, that these are the games i love the most or was it sentimental different things i some of the games on the list are super sentimental and some are very practical. Like that's what I want to play right now. So I would say it's a good combination of that a couple here, a couple there. And, and sort of what kind of gamer are you? If I, I, if you were to choose using the board game geek ratings, your ideal weight, where does that sit? Or are you completely all over the, so all over the map? I've changed. Like when I first started, I was definitely, uh, I want to play everything. Like, I don't care what it is. Right. Um, but lately I've sort of maybe I've maybe I've found a little too much like the two heavy games are too much for me to handle. And that just sounds weird, right? Like I'm like, oh, am I over the hill with the board with the board gaming? But I, I, I can't deny how I feel because I, I sit there and we're like, okay, we're doing the rules for big 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 Euro game came out last year, lots of rules. And I'm like, oh man, we're half an hour into these rules and I I've forgotten what we, you know what I mean? Like I just get that fatigue of it and I'm like, huh, do I really enjoy? And I have to really ask myself, like, am I, do I really enjoy these heavy games? Right. It's the myth of the heavy gamer is what we call it. Like me and Lance Mikester, right. Undead Viking. We're always like, we want to play these heavy games because we want to be challenged and we want to see something new and we want to see like really cool stuff. And that, and that happens in heavy games. Right. Uh, but I've found that I can't, the fatigue of it, like, Oh, it's not as fun as I really wanted it to be. So I've maybe gone a little lighter lately, but I really do like it, all types of games. I like I won't turn anything down usually, but I have find myself waning from the heavier stuff. Like over the past twenty years, changed a little bit. I mean, do you see there's been a proliferation in sort of heavy Euro games? I mean, I think when I got into the hobby, there wasn't really. I mean, I'm sure he was designing games at the time, but there didn't seem to be as many sort of Vital Lacerda type games, super heavy City of the Big Shoulders type, very heavy. Euro games. Do you think there are more of them now? I think there are because we're, you know, we were just dipping our toes into this type of stuff when I got into it. Settlers had just come out when I started gaming. So you build on top of other people's stuff, right? Like the standing on the shoulders. And I think when someone discovers mechanics or a cool way to do something, then you basically take those mechanics and then let's go crazy. Like there are fit, there are people who design and you, you know, invent. And then there are people who take that invention and, use it to their ultimate power. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like if it's all asserted, right? Like he'll take all kinds of mechanics and put them all in this ma amazingly cool game. The, it's sort of like an evolution, right? Like the first invention had to happen for, for those heavy games to be created. Right. And then I assume it'll just keep going. So yeah, I think there are more heavy games these days than there used to be. And, and do you think, these heavy games i i mean i've started rediscovering reiner canizia stuff from the 90s and the early 2000s and the the when i play these heavier games 
they don't seem any deeper than these Reiner Canizia games. They just seem more complicated, right? Yeah. Well, Reiner's the master, right? He has that simplicity, depth, depth through simplicity, right? You think, oh, it's only got four rolls. How hard could this game be? Or how interesting could it be? But you really do find out sometimes his like, oh, it's more than you think. And only after you play it a few five, ten times, then you start seeing, oh, it's even deeper than that, right? Like there's all kinds of layers through Reiner Canizia. So it's hard to like Vital Lacerda, who just layers on tons of mechanics, but that creates an, a, an impressive complexity as well. But yeah, some of the earlier games are just as satisfying, I guess, right? So, you know, I imagine, I imagine that, you know, I, I've inferred this from simply seeing how big the BGG collection is. I imagine you have lots of games. How would you feel about them all being destroyed and only having five games with you? Are you are you attached to your collection? Um, I used to be. <laughs> uh, I used to be more attached to it. But I think over time, I've felt less so. And that's probably also because it's not in my near vicinity. They're mostly all stored in a warehouse, which is about 20 minutes away. So if you, when you see the games, you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that game. And I remember that game. But then as the, the distance away, right, like I have almost no games in the house right now. But uh, I've grown less at- less attached to them. I know a lot of people are like, I can't believe you put that X, ex- you know, that super rare collectible game in the library for people to play. And I'm like, well, what do I what am I going to do with it? I want like I can just let it sit there and collect dust for years and then sell it maybe someday. So I feel less attached to the games. I do definitely feel like a loss of all the games would be probably devastating. So yeah, I mean, just to put it into, if you really, really believe that, okay, all my games are gone and I only have five forever and ever. Yeah. It would be pretty devastating, I think. And so this, this warehouse, you know, if I were to walk in there, how many games roughly do you think are there? Well, you'd see all of the releases from Essen last year, which I think was over a thousand in multiple in multiple copies <laughs> and then you would go into the back room and you would see the what we call the alphabet uh and that's all games from previous years pruned uh down to the best best games or the ones that are most popular i should say not necessarily the best um and that would be 40 shelves of 200 games each so it's about six to seven eight thousand something like that on shelves and then you would see 5,000 or so in tubs of in back storage. So that's the, like, I think we're well over 10,000 now total. I, I want to go back to the beginning. So when you were growing up as a child, were you, were you destined to, to be involved in board games? Was, was gaming around a lot in your household? Yeah. I mean, um, before I got the video game stuff, for sure, we played... I remember when playing with my brother, we had Monopoly, obviously, but we also had the Jewish Monopoly called Hootspah. I'm not Jewish, by the way, but we had the Jewish Monopoly <laughs> and we played that a ton. And we always like had board games around and my neighbors, my, my um, childhood um, friends, neighbors had games too. So I, I'm just, you know, thinking back on all the stuff we did as kids, like we played a lot of games. We played a lot of board. Games. I remember sitting on the floor playing like battling tops and, the slime monster game, you know, where this all kinds of cool eighties games. So I do remember playing games a lot as a child until obviously the video game stuff came and then kind of switched to those. Um, but we always played games. I played Dungeons and Dragons growing up uh, when it wasn't cool. Yeah. So it's always been around me. I mean, I never thought I would make a living off of it. I mean, it never seemed, you never. I think as a kid, I just think like, Oh, these games exist. Cause something, somebody wanted to make them, but like you never knew you were never aware of like the process or the work required to make a game. So I never, you know, you just kind of just took it for granted, but yeah, I guess, I guess I was always destined for this. And I honestly thought I would be a video game programmer for the rest of my life. And so you grew up in Florida and you always see these things on Facebook that says type in Florida man. And then any word after that and something crazy will come up is Florida as crazy so when as I, we've been when I live there when I live there no <laughs> I felt like it was just a pretty average town like it's by the beach um we li- I live in South Florida Pompano Beach um but I'm just trying to think of like as I, in a times change right like so I lived there in the 70s and the 80s and I moved out in the 90s so I'm and I well I went to uh, University of Florida which is still Florida but Gainesville is like this really kind of secluded town in Central Florida um, but I don't remember 
that stuff happening. I mean, you also, we have a better communication now, right? Like we have the internet now. We didn't back then. So you didn't hear about stuff. Uh, you never heard about like big crime or um, weird stuff. Yeah, it was pretty normal. But yeah, now today it's just nuts. <laughs> yeah, absolutely crazy. So, so what was the first hobby game that drew you in? When did you become a gamer? So I was trying to think of that. Like I would... So Settlers was my mo- my modern day, but I definitely played stuff in college with a buddy that I attribute to me, like opening my eyes to more stuff. He had 221B Baker Street. He had Games Workshop games. We played Talisman. He had just a, and I'm trying to think of the other. Those are the two major ones that I remember. And I was like, oh, wow, these are pretty cool. Like, what are these? Right. And we, I, I think it just stopped there because he owned them. And in college, like you just didn't have any money, like. I didn't go searching for more games to buy. Plus I didn't want to keep stuff moving. I mean, I was moving out soon. Um, so that I would probably attribute to a more like hobby gamer experience. Like th- that's when I saw board games as not just the mainstream stuff like Monopoly and Scrabble. Um, but fast forward like a few years after college and I got into s- to settlers. That was the true game that made me think, Oh, these are pretty cool. What else is there? And this was sort of like... So So, how long did it take you to become a fully-fledged gamer, you know, with a shelf of games? And and back then, how easy was it for you to get sort of hobby games? Were there a lot around? Um, yeah, so I would say 97, 98 was when I really got into it. Um, and the internet was around, but it wasn't fully commercialized yet. Um it was hard to track down information. There was a, I don't know if you're aware of a thing called Usenet, which was um, basically like a global bulletin board system. Uh, people could post up things. And there was a sub uh, a group called rec, rec.games.board, which was a bulletin board system about board games. And so I would look there and I forget what brought me there. I think it was some like me looking for an old games workshop game. And I searched, I think there was some search engines like Alta Vista or something like that. This is pre Google um, that brought me to Rec Games Board. And I started reading it. And that's when I read about the Dallas Metro Gamers. <laughs> so it's a local group here in Dallas. Um, they had weekly sessions, they were getting together, and people were writing about the games, right? And so I in- self invited my, I invited myself to that group and I got in. I got like basically, uh, they interviewed me and checked to see if I wasn't a wanker. That was their words. Uh, so once I got into that group, uh, I started learning about German games, right? Like they had a lot of, I, I started reading about Demacher. I started reading about like, um, oh, I was obsessed with trying to find Elf and Road because um, that was a big gr- game in, I think it had won the Spiel des Jahres at the time, but I didn't know what Spiel des Jahres was. I just read that everybody's talking about Elf and Road or Elf and Land. I, I think it was Elf and Roads though. Um, and I went to all the shops in Dallas to try to find it. And that's when I picked up Catan. And uh, I also bought Manhattan. But then after I started getting into that Metro Gamers group, we played all kinds of stuff and people were ordering things. And I'm like, well, where do you get this? Uh, and how are you finding out about these games? And that's when I got turned into the Diggers mailing list, which is a Yahoo group, which also had a, uh, a interview process to get in. And I'm like, once I got in there, but you know, you, there was a lot of gatekeeping back then. Um, I got in and I started reading about all these games. They had, you know, the archive was still available. Like you could go on yahoo.com and read the older emails, even though it was just an email group, it was archived all on Yahoo. And I was just reading about this stuff. I'm like, wow, these are amazing. Where are all these games? That's when I got turned on to Adam Spielt, which is a German, it was a German retailer online. And they, um, well, no, they weren't online. You would get a catalog, like a color, full color catalog, all in German. And you could just call them and they spoke English and you could say, I want this and this and this. And you'd try to do your German pronunciations. Like, I want a feller und Fennig, <laughs> you know, like, okay. And they would ship the games and you get it like, they were pretty fast. Uh, the box would be beat up, but I was ordering like a couple hundred game dollar worth of games every couple weeks. I was, I was going nuts just based on the cover. And that's when I started getting the shelf, right? Like, Oh, where am I going to put these? Well, I need a shelf. Well, let me go to the container store and buy a bookshelf. Right. So that's sort of right around 99 is when I really went nuts. And then that's where the board game geek idea kind of sparked. I had been running a video game website 
um, that I was shutting down because of lack of, it was a user driven news website about 3d games called 3d game geek. <laughs> Very uh, unique. Um, so basically board game geek grew out of that code. So I took that code and oh, like literally over a weekend wrote board game geek and launched it uh, early January 20 or in the year 2000. So you worked at this time, I guess you were working in the video game industry. So how did you end up in video games and, and what was it like working in them in the nineties? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I graduated from university of Florida with a computer engineering degree and Back then, telecom was huge, right? Cell phones had just started coming to America. Um, and so I got interviewed by a ca- Canadian company called BNR or t- um, Nortel. Um, and they, they hired everybody. <laughs> like if you had a degree, you were hired. <laughs> so I flew out to Dallas to interview with them. And I'm like, oh my God, it's a big city. I never really lived in a big city, right? I, I mean, I lived near big cities, but I didn't live in one. Um, I was like, oh man, I, this would be such an adventure, right? Living in the big city. I just remember driving around in rush hour traffic in Dallas and I'm like, oh, this is for me. So I got into telecom first out of college and I think I wrote like 50 lines of code in the three years I worked there. So it was pretty terribly like challenging as far as like a, vid, like a programmer. So I worked there for three years and my buddy from college calls me out in uh, California, Silicon Valley. He's like, do you want to get into video game stuff? Like we're making these 3D graphics cards and they need a person who knows Max. I'm like, I don't know Max. He goes, doesn't matter. <laughs> like, okay. So I flew out there, interviewed there. It was a full day interview. I had an offer at the end of the day. I flew back to Dallas. And I told my girlfriend, I'm like, I'm moving. And she's like, what? I was very selfish, by the way. I did not ask her to come with me. I'm like, I'll see you later. And we just broke up. So I moved out to, to LA or uh, not LA, um, um, San Jose and got into the startup for 3d graphics called 3d effects. And then that sort of, as a Mac guy, <laughs> I was the Mac guy. Uh, I got to fly around to all these different companies doing games for Macs and doing 3d games. So like Bungie a company called lion video game, you know, they were making the games at that time. And I was like, wow, when I flew, when I went to all these different places, especially Bungie, that was the one that really affected me. It's like, wow, this is really a cool job, right? They're all sitting around in a room making games. They're just talking about games all the time. You go out to dinner with them. They're like, did you play this? Did you play that? And everybody's just games, games, games. I'm like, I need to get into video games. So I was, I was just at 3d effects going, gliding along. And my buddy from the the buddy who got me to come out to 3d effects had quit six months, like after I got there, I'm like, Oh, great. I moved out here because of you. So he moved back. He moved back to Dallas. There is a pair of guys actually. Um, but he called the Charlie Brown is his name. He he called me again at when I was li- working at 3D Effects. He's like, "Hey, do you want to come to Dallas and work in video games?" I'm like, what are you doing to me, man? <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh man, maybe I should check this out." So I actually took a business trip and combined it with an interview when I moved back to Dallas. And I interviewed with a bunch of video game companies when I was here. <laughs> including Ion Storm, which if people know that, that was a crazy company. Um, but I ended up at this company called Ritual Entertainment, which did the game Sin and Heavy Metal Fact 2. Um, and I took that job and I flew back. My girlfriend was still we, bit there. We got back together, which is just nuts. And then, um, like, I lived in da- – then I'm in Dallas as a video game program, and it's like living the dream, uh, except it's a super hard job. <laughs> like, video game programming is the hardest job I've ever had. Um, so I worked there and then I quit ritual in 2000 uh, at the end of 2000, I should say. And I went to 3d realms, which people know that created Duke Nukem and Duke Nukem forever. I worked on the Duke Nukem forever game, which I think came out a few years ago. Uh, but I worked there for five years. Also being the board game geek guy, just running as a spare, like a, you know, just spare time ran it out of a computer, one computer sitting in my bedroom yeah, so that's sort of how it started. Is that the answer to the question? I guess that's how I got into video games. Just a friend called me up and he's like, "Do you want to get into video games?" I'm like, sure. But that's the thing about video games. Everybody's like, "How do I get? How do I get into video games?" I'm like, just know somebody. So, so your first game then is Tigris and Euphrates. Now, yes. I wasn't into games when this come when this came out, but I I've heard a lot when it came out that it caused a lot of discussion. Why was this? Was it a big deal when it came out? Yeah, I think it, I remember, and this was all reading through blogs and stuff, and it had come out 
before I was super into this, like tracking news and information, but apparently Reiner had promised this game like many years before it actually came out and it kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed. And then it was like, okay, it finally came out. It's, it's a Reiner big box strategy game. And, and that's what I remember the, the, the controversy of it, right? Like it was just so late and was it good enough to be worth the delays? Right. Um, but for me, and was he the big name at the time? He was the name everybody was talking about. In fact, like our game group was like sick of it, right? Like, like, Oh, a Reiner game, you know, like there was a joke about like, we only play Reiner games or, you know, like he's the only guy game or, you know, the only designer worth playing, like everything else pales. That was, you know, in 2000. So they had these preconceived things about Reiner, but I had not had experience Reiner and I got to play Tiger Shoot Euphrates and I'm like, Holy crap. This game's fantastic. I just remember all the like brain, all the brain work I went through to play that game. And I was playing with the people who invited me to the Metro gamers, or I invited myself to, I should say that night of the interview is when it happened when I first played it and they were playing hard against each other. And I kind of snuck in there and made those little kind of sneaky moves that you can do in that game. And kind of like, it just won. And they were like, they, they were stunned, right? Like, so that has always been in my brain for that game is like that first play. I was fascinated by it. I had to order it from Germany. Um, got it from Adam Spielt, the, uh, the original version. Yeah. And it just sat in my brain a long time. And I actually implemented a on online play of it on board game geek. Uh, so you could basically log into your board game geek account and go play Tiger and Euphrates, but ter- it was turn-based, right? You do turn and the other person do turn and you'd go back and forth, like play by email kind of thing, but it was graphical and it had some, <laughs> basically I was like learning web, coding of you know by creating that game and it ran for a lot of years but i shut it down eventually and so what would you say to someone who's reluctant to play it how would you convince them to sit down at the table with you gosh yeah i mean i know a lot of people just they don't they don't like the simpleness of it right the plainness of it i don't know i guess i would just say it's got some of the most interesting decisions you'll ever make in a game right with two actions you'll just be like you'll be agonizing over what to do um I mean, you try to say it's the struggle of empires, right? Like the rise and fall of civilizations. And it's sort of like an abs, but it's, it's kind of an abstract game, right? But it's got, it's themeless abstract or sorry, abstracted through the theme is come through the abstract nature of the game. So it's a little bit of a hard sell uh, these days because all of the displays of everything now is so crazy, like overproduced, right? Like the production value of games, like brings people in like, Ooh, what is that? But this one has a simple layout and. Yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a hard sell sometimes, but once I tell people, and some people just don't like it. Like, they're like, why? What? That didn't do anything for me. And I'm like, well, maybe play it a few more times. But then, you know, that barrier of the first play is so hard to get over. Like, if you don't like a game on the first play, most people will not play that game again. They'll just move on. And so we've, we've kind of touched on this, but how... How integral do you think Rainer Knizia is to the hobby today? Would the hobby be in any way similar if Rainer Knizia hadn't been around 20 years ago designing these games? Yeah, good point. Uh, good question. Um, I don't think so. Because remember when I was saying, like, inventors invent, right? Like, he is that inventor. Yeah, and he put auctions in games. Like, I remember, like, Modern Art being the first game where I've ever, like, auctioned anything. Yeah, so I think he's that core, right? Like he created a lot of the core concepts of modern board gaming. So I don't know if there was if there was no Reiner, there would I think those things would eventually happen, right? Like they're kind of obvious. Although I say that, like, oh, deck building was obvious, but it didn't happen until, you know, like 10 years ago. So it's like, yeah, so it's hard to predict. Like if he wasn't there, if he didn't invent the wheel, would the wheel have been invented? Yeah, I don't know. I think he's core. Like he's irreplaceable, right? Like I don't think Maybe there would be a different Reiner, but I don't think so because he's just so prolific. Like he has designed hundreds of games, like that people build off of, right? So I want to talk now. Go into Board Game Geek, and you, you've mentioned quite a bit of it. But so, so before you start it, so you talked about these this this sort of Yahoo email thing, and but was there anything that was like a central database for games that was similar to BGG, or was BGG completely original at this time? Um, I think back in the day when I surfed for board games, it would be. It would be Usenet. It would be the uh, that Yahoo group of talking. Um, but there was also the Game Cabinet. 
I don't know if you've heard of that. That was the core um, place you went to find information about games, but it had been defunct for many years when I got in. Mix Fellov had a blog. Uh, Stefano Sullivan had a blog. Uh, Stuart Daggard. That was a very cool like zine, right? Like paper. You could only get it on paper form. Um but it was thick. It was like a hundred pages, like double, you know, folded over and stapled. And it was just dense filled with board game information, like reviews. It was so good. Yeah. Th- those were the things it was so, it was so archaic, right? It was sort of like I searched everywhere. Like I would use those old Alta Vista search engine, you know, or like the dog pile or, but it was just hard to find right information. I'm like, this sucks. This is, everything's hard to find. Why can't we just have a central board game website with all the games on them um i'm like man this that was the thing i'm like i want to track what games are out i want to know what i've got and i want to talk about them and that was sort of the you know the aha like oh i can use this 3d game geek code because that's like a blog and then i could basically do a database of the items right to track those games and then it sort of grew from there like let's come up with all the mechanics of games (laughs) like paper and pencil. We just started writing them all down and it was based on our collections right at the time. Like what games did we own? We'll start there and just go and enter. And the Metro gamers uh, guys were really good about that. They, I gave them all the admin proper, you know, power and they could just go create, like take their collection and just add it in. Right. The bare minimum of information designer, uh, name of the game, a brief description uh, what year did it come out? You know, that kind of stuff. And so was it always the intention to have it as a, not just a central information repository, but a, but a community where people could come in and add their own stuff and write reviews and posts and opinions and all of that sort of stuff. It was, no, it was never designed that way. (laughs) Like I just wanted like a read only kind of thing. Right. But we would put all the info information into it, but then we're like, Oh, this is really hard, (laughs) right? Like all we're doing all day long is cutting and pasting stuff. And we had permission, like, so in that Yahoo group, Thousands of reviews, thousands of session reports. Um, Greg Schlosser, definitely one of those guys that was super prolific. He played every week, maybe some multiple times a week. He wrote detailed reports of everything he played, thousands of them for years, all in this, all in this group. And um, I'm like, Greg, can we like just cut and paste these and like attribute them to you? And he's like, Yeah, sure. <laughs> like, okay, we'll start cutting and pasting. I'm like huh, maybe we should just make it where they could do it themselves. <laughs> like, like we just, cause all we're doing is cutting and pasting and giving attribution. Why don't we make it so they could do it? That's where the user system came in. So I'm like, Oh, people can create an account and then upload their own stuff. Uh, okay. Let's do that. You know, write code, write code. Okay. We launched it. <laughs> Everybody can start adding stuff now. Oh, awesome. 500 reports come in from Ben Baldanza Thousands of game session reports come in from Greg Schlosser. All these reviewers were like, oh, I can finally post my stuff somewhere. Boom, here you go. And then that's sort of where it took off, right? Like that user creation. I guess you would call it Web 2.0, right? Like user-generated content. And then it, it just has gone crazy from that. And so Die Macher is famously the first game that was put into the database. And in the new reprint, that was sort of part of the ad copy. Why... Why this one? Why was Die Macher the first BGG It, it honestly game? was the top game right there. We were just the one we were thinking about the most, right? At the time, it was in our collections, and we just picked that one out and did it. <laughs> like, that was it. And it was based on our collections. It was also based on session reports that um, people had written. They're like, ah, oh, we got some session reports for this. Let's let's make that the first one. No, no reason. In, I mean, like, it was not for any love of it, I don't think. Like, it was just, oh, there's the first one. <laughs> let's do it. But yeah, it's kind of weird, right? Because it's like the granddaddy Euro, Euro deep Euro game from back in the day. And so you, it took you became full time BGG in two thousand and five, I believe. So, firstly, why why did it take you five years for it to become your job? And then, what was the feeling, sort of waking up that first morning where you thought, "Board game geek is my job now." Yeah, exactly. Well, I've been, I wasn't really, I guess I can't lie. The Duke Nukem Forever game was never coming out. Like it was, it was just this endless crunch cycle of making a video game, right? In my previous company, we did two games in three years, right? This was my fifth year and I'm kind of like, yeah, kind of getting a little like bored with it. Um, Board Game Geek had been growing like more and more, like getting more users, getting more 
demand, right? It had moved out of my bedroom into a, uh, a you know, a real computer, you know, website, like it racks of servers, like that needed work. Someone had to maintain all that stuff. Um, and I'm like, I just got to, I'm spending all my time, my free time doing this. Why don't I just do it full time? That was like the decision. Like it was at Kubla on, I remember this exact moment talking about it. And it's like, it was the summer of, yeah. Oh, four. Or it was Memorial Day weekend, actually, because that's when Kublacon is. So it's right about now, back in 04. Um, it's on the train from San Francisco to uh, where the Kublacon is, which is just outside of San Fran. And I'm like, you know what? I should just just do this full time. Like, I think we can make it work. Like, we just sell ads and stuff. We had, like, we had, ta- like, we had been approached by people to sell ads. And we just kind of didn't do it. Uh, we had AdWords on there. And we started making a little bit of money. And we're like, oh, this could probably afford me. Uh, you know, with a, with a pretty large pay cut. Um, I'm like, I'll just do it. <laughs> like, okay, let's do it. And I quit that at the end of that year out of 3d realms. Um, and then in January of 2005, I woke up, you're right. Like I woke up that next day. I'm like, Oh, this is my full-time job now. Hmm. What do I do now? <laughs> All right. What's the first thing I should do? Well, I'd always been wanting to write this system, you know, this programming thing. So I did it right. And like, then that was that. And just like one after the other, like, development came really quickly back then. Um, it didn't need to be, a, it's, it, it's changed a lot. It needs to be a lot more robust to handle millions of users. But back then it was like thousands of users, right? It wasn't, it wasn't millions. In fact, I was just looking at some stats the other day. It took us five years to get to 50,000 users. And last month on board game geek, we signed up 50,000 users. So that's, that's kind of the difference of what has happened in all those years. But, but even, even there at that, that point, sort of five years in, did it feel like it was the, the center of the hobby in the way, it, in the way it is now? I don't know. I always feel it's, it, it's hard to take, you know, be objective about it. I mean, I want it to be like, I, it's my baby. Right. Um, and I'm that's why I think I said to you offline, like I'm very sensitive to the criticism of it. Like it's like, why don't you like my baby? Uh, but that's yeah, I'm trying to get past that kind of feeling and and make the best thing we can do. But yeah, I don't know. It's I I guess it's the center. Like I mean, I'm I want it. I want the the goal of Board Game Geek is to be the definitive resource for all board games. That was that was that was the goal. Um, and then the other things have kind of sprung off of it, like the marketplace and the conventions and you know those things and the cruises and just the videos we do and it's just all sprung from that idea, right? Like how can we keep this hobby growing and people being finding information about it? Like that's sort of the, that's sort of the goal. So your next game then is, is a classic and a, a, a sort of very aged classic at this point. And this is Arkham horror. So, you know, Arkham horror is often been cited as the first co-op game. Was it, was it, which version, firstly, are we talking about here? Are we talking about that 80s one? Are you talking about the I was hoping second you were edition from that. FFG? <laughs> I was hoping you were going to ask me that. <laughs> I was just going to say all of them. Um, no, but I guess I would probably go back to the original. Uh, not the original original, but the the second, I guess it's second edition is what you would call it. Um, the second edition that had like 15 expansions for it, I think. Uh, that one. That one is my favorite just because of how crazy it could get. Like just the, it was very, um, the play space of it could go really off the rails, right? You could, sometimes you could see like, oh, there's no way we're going to win based on what, what's, what's going on. That one is the one that's just so wild and crazy. Like I, I just love what every, what, it, what it, everything it does. I just love sometimes you can have a crap game of it, right? Like you can get stuck and you can't do anything. Um, but I just love the way the system worked. It was, and, and I think fantasy flight or who the designers like, they wanted more control. Like, so that's why they kind of revised it to the, um, to the other versions of it. Right. Like those are very structured and controlled and it, you can't go, you can't have these really crazy combinations come out. So that's what I just love about it. And I love the, the mythos. I love that horror genre. Like I'm not a, I don't like typical horror, like monster, you know, like movie monster type stuff. I really like the weird, Oh, this monster teleports to you. And like, takes you away and carries you up in the sky and drops you like all that stuff that the, that those monsters do plus and having a great old one, which is virtually in- invincible, just having that challenge, right? Like you're like, wow, we really got to, you know, you go into 
in Arkham Horror, you could potentially win before the old one awakens, right? But if it awakens, then you're like, oh, well, how do we, can we possibly win? We're like, most of the times you can't. Uh, but I like that you can try. So that was, that's, it's just that creepiness and spookiness of it and all the weird things that happen just makes me love it. And how do you feel about the proliferation of Lovecraft themes in games? Are you bored of it yet or do you still embrace it? Um, no, I embrace it. I'm not bored of it. I'm not, it's not like zombies. Zombies, I'm thinking I'm a little over, but I'll pretty much buy any Lovecraft game still. Like, I, you know, Pandemic Lovecraft is one of my favorite versions. I'll play a card game based on Cthulhu stuff. It's, I don't know, it's just one of those things I don't think I could ever get tired of. Now I say that, I'll be like, next year, I'll be like, uh, there's 15 more Cthulhu games out. Oh, uh, okay, maybe I am getting bored of it. But I really do love it. Um, I love the mythos, and I love the spookiness of it, the era, the 20s, right? Like, so cool. Uh, do you think it it is that, it, the it creates such a such a world, such an atmosphere that draws so many gamers to it. Must be, yeah, it must be. Um, there's something about it. You can't wrap your head around it, right? Like, you think about it. If you put any real deep thought into like the existence of this stuff, like, okay, it's so crazy that it can't possibly happen. But here it is in a game. Uh, so I think that's what people like about it. So I want to talk now about one of the most talked about things in gaming. And this is the uh, BGG Top 100. So when did that come in, the idea to rank games based on user oh, judgment? Gosh. Oh, it's been it's been long enough now that I don't remember when it when it first started. I would say maybe it was the early, t- mid, mid-2000s, I think, is when it started. What people don't know about Board Game Geek is a lot of things were not well thought out. <laughs> that would be really shocking, right? We're like, oh, would it be cool to do this? Like, yeah, it would be really cool. And I would spend a night of coding and it would be done, right? I just put it out. Like not knowing what the implications of meaning a 10 point rating system would be, right? Like everybody's like, oh, it's a terrible rating. So, you know, like, uh, okay, well, it was, it was the right thing to do at the time. And now we have it and we have millions and millions of ratings. Like, what do we do with them? Well, let's rank it. Let's just put them in a ranking, whatever. Okay. Code it done. Hey, here's the top 5,000 ranked games. <laughs> like, okay, done. Then 20 years later, you start getting like, oh, this game is terrible. Why is it number one? It doesn't have any appeal to the, the, the regular public. Like if times have changed, right? Like even in the past five years, like a lot more people are coming. A lot more scrutiny comes out. A lot more criticism. A lot more, I think, overthinking of things personally. I'm not an overthinker. I try not to overthink things. It slows me down, right? Um like a casual person coming across this list with hey, all these games are not good for casual people. Like, well, okay, I agree with that, but there's a family game thing, but it's not the top 100, right? It's there's an alternative ranking system that people can't find. And that's my fault. Um, probably to uh, finding things on BGG has always been hard just because there's so much stuff, right? It's a, it's a very challenging, uh, you know, user experience challenge. Like we have a, we have a full-time UX guy right now and he's like, uh, you know, he, he boggles at some of this. He, once he realizes how much stuff there is, like each time we expose him to another facet of board game, he's like, Oh God, you know, like it just, it overwhelms him even as an expert. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Like it came out in the mid 2000s, early 2000s, mid 2000s. And then it's just sort of grown from there. I didn't think it would be a, such a, uh, I mean, I guess I should have thought that, but, People, I didn't think people would go to it and point to it as, oh, this is the best game ever, right? Like, cause, but gaming is a very personal, subjective experience, right? Like, uh, some of those games on the top 100 are not my favorite games at all. Like, they're not even close, right? So I understand that, but they are a favorite of a lot of people. So I, it, that's the way it is. I don't know. I don't, I try, I don't have a good explanation for why it is, but it is <laughs> and why we did it. I'm like, well, we, oh, we have all these ratings. Let's just rank, let's just sort it. Right. You're, as a computer programmer, you sort things <laughs> like that's the way it works. You make things and then you sort them and you want to look at them. And it's interesting. And that's what it was. <laughs> How are they ranked? Uh, I think we, because obviously we, if you've got a game that's got 10 ratings of 10, that can't go to number one. Right. With an average rating of 10. Yeah, And I think we had that, that in the early days, we had that problem. We are like, oh, these games that only have a few ratings are not, they're going to always be at the top and that. And that felt weird, right? Like all you needed was like 10 friends to come in and whatever, uh, manipulate it. But um, then I started researching about uh, ranking systems and the Bayesian average kept coming up. 
Beijing average, Beijing average. So that is a way to add, in essence, think of it as adding 5.5 to every game like 100 times. So Beijing average sort of brings the lower, the games that don't have as many ratings down to the center, right? Like if it has 10 tens and 100 5.5s, what's the average? Well, it's 5.6, right? Or something like 5.59, whatever. That's what it, that's what sorts it. We call it the geek rating. So, because Beijing average, people don't know what that is unless you Google it. Uh, so geek rating, there you go. Like that's, and then there's a pure average. People can still access that. Um, and if you sort by pure average, you're going to get those 10 perfect tens right across the board. But the Bayesian average I thought was clever. And I think IMDB uses it. And that's probably what caught my eye about it. So that's basically what it is. And so, you know, there's a lot of debate. It, it, it's, you know, it, it's that sign, I think, of being a gamer. It's when you, when you cross that, that border into actually being a gamer is when you start talking about the BGG Top 100 and what's in there. To what degree do you think it represents the real taste of the gaming community? Or do you think there's a there's a tyranny of the present moment with newer games being favoured more? It's also a growth problem. I mean, I don't know if you call it a problem, but back in the day, there was only a couple thousand board game geek users, right? Today, there are millions. So something that hits big, like let's say Gloomhaven, for instance, hmm, that had a big release, like 100,000 copies went out, mostly Geek's Bottom, right? Like I don't, like my mom wouldn't buy that game. Um, and that, they, oh, I've got to go rate it. Let me go rate on Board Game Geek. So quantity of votes also has played a part, right? So like there's no adjustment for time, right? Like maybe some of those older, that's why those older games don't, stay in the top 100 because there's one, you can't buy them sometimes. Um, and two people aren't playing the old games. They want to just get the new stuff. And then that's, and if they're just getting in, are they going to go buy Tigris and Euphrates? Probably not. Will they buy Gloomhaven? Probably because everybody's talking about it or wingspan. Everybody's talking about it. Uh, so I think that bias of time also is affects the board, the top 100. Um, I mean, I guess that's my my feeling of how it is happens. Um, so newer games will get higher quicker because more people are buying them and more people are rating them, whereas they're not so much going back. That's why th- there, we talked about the schooling of board gamers, right? Like I, I've always wanted to put out my 100 games you must play that came out before 2005. Like I need to make that list. <laughs> like, but I don't know if anybody will listen to me. Like, I don't, you know, people and some of those games were far out of print. But yeah, it's sort of that. Do you jump into calculus or do you go back and learn basic math, algebra, you know, those things. It's like, well, you don't because that's not what people are doing. They want to play wingspan. So let's get wingspan. Then that goes shoots up. That's my uh, two cents on it, I guess. So your next game then is, is the current number one and that's Gloomhaven. Now I don't want to ask you whether it deserves it, but I, I want to ask you in what ways, because it's number one, a lot of people think it represents board gaming. In what ways does it do that? For me, it's the best dungeon game ever. Like I play all of them, right? I try to dungeon crawling games are my, like probably my favorite genre. It does it better than every, all of them, (laughs) right? Like everything I do is compared to Gloomhaven. (laughs) Like, is this better than Gloomhaven? No. Why are we bothering playing it? You know, like it's, it's harsh because I like to see all the different types of dungeon games. But if I get into that feeling where it's like, Oh, I could be playing Gloomhaven instead of this. Well, that's that's why, right? It's it's done it so well. The mechanics of it challenge you if you really get into it and you really understand the characters' diversities and their strengths and weaknesses and, and the teamwork involved. And it's just it hits all those things perfectly for me. And I guess that does for a lot of other people too, right? Like dungeon I think dungeon crawling is pretty big in board gaming. This solves that problem for me. I don't have to role play. I just get the story. I get the problems. I get the you know. I get the monster fighting and puzzles and all that stuff in a box for a hundred bucks. That's why. That's the game. And so, did it surprise you when it got to number one? A little bit, yeah. Because I didn't realize so many people were into this stuff. And I remember, I remember a sort of a thing that happened at BGGCon. We were, we were playing 
uh, we were doing a, a preview event with Isaac Childress, the designer, and a woman came up to him and and asked him a, a secret. She whispered to him in the ear, and he goes, "Oh!" And he took a paper and he wrote something down, and he handed it back to her. I'm like, "Oh, so there's something going on here, right? Like Gloomhaven related." She said some code word to him too. Like I don't remember what it was. And I'm like, "Oh my gosh, this is deep." Right. Like there's something, and I don't even know what they're talking about because I haven't played Gloomhaven as much as I should have. Uh, and that's another reason why I'm bringing it to the cabin because I want to kind of finish it. And I'm like, wow, this is different. Right. Like I, that's an unexpected event that I never have seen in board gaming. There's some kind of meta thing going on, secret puzzle. And I asked her what it was. And she, like, she was kind of, she went out the room. And when I came out of the room, she was standing there and she was writing something down on her paper. And I said, well, what was that all about? And she goes, and she just yanks the paper away and like hides it from me. And I'm like, okay, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know what, right. Like, like, okay, that's something different that, that it, maybe there's more to this than just the board game. Right. Which could be its popularity as well. Right. To help. Like if you know the secret club, then you've got something else beyond just regular play playing the game. So there's something special about it for sure. And so we, we're recording just after, Isaac has made oodles and oodles of money on the Frosthaven campaign. Just under, How excited you know, are you uh, for Frosthaven? I'm super excited. I want to see what it evolves into. Um, now, it's been a while since I played Gloomhaven, so I'm kind of like, maybe I should go back and finish it uh, before I go into the Frosthaven stuff. But I think it's going to be a, enough stand Like, it's sort of a reset in the world. Um, maybe there were some events that happened in Gloomhaven that might have an effect there. So a little bit of spoiler. But... Um, I'm super excited for it. It's kind of like another giant thing, right? To explore that hopefully someday I have time to do in the cabin. <laughs> you know, like I'm waiting for those days. I, I should just play it instead of waiting. But um, that was surprising too, because we're in an economic pr- hurt, hurtful time right now to a lot of people. But to have him come out at this time and make just under 13 million, I think is what it was, 12.95, something like that. Um, is stunning. <laughs> like, I can't believe it. And it's good for him. I mean, that's awesome. It must be rewarding to have that work. You know, it's, it's his life's work uh, be so economically successful. Yeah. Because most people's isn't. So um, I want to talk now about the, the community in BGG. And I think I kind of know the answer because we were talking a bit about this before we started recording, but Gaming communities, especially video game communities, are famous for being contentious and febrile and argumentative. How healthy do you feel the community is on BGG, and is that changing? Um, it's grown a lot, um, and it evolves, right? Like, we used to – I'm personally very libertarian. I think people should can say whatever they want to say. However, I have understood the impact of that lately with Board Game Geek, right? We used to not censor anything. We used to just let everything fly. That creates a very unwelcome experience when on a forum, right? If you feel scared to post things because of the fear of retaliation personally, now intellectually we're okay with like our differing opinions, right? Just as long as it doesn't cross into the ad hominem or insults or, you know, all these things like there's, there's, there's a, 50 rules on board game geek of things that we find that we say, well, that's cross the line. We're going to moderate. So we used to have a very light moderation. Like only the really egregious stuff was taken down. We've increased the, (laughs) we've increased that. I want a healthy community. Like I think board gaming should not be driven by who's more right, you know, like arguing all the time. So I, it's and and we don't stop that like regular arguing about like why this is good or that's bad or whatever fine but as soon as it turns into that toxicity um we stamp down on that so i'm hoping we've sort of turned the corner on that we we were i think we were accused of being a very toxic place maybe a year ago two years ago but we've changed that like and i felt and we gotten a lot of compliments for that um and of course there's also people who feel that they should be able to say anything on the internet. And I'm with you. You can say anything on the internet, just not here, right? Like you can go to Twitter for that or the, the sites that don't moderate, like Twitter doesn't moderate. Right. So, and so we just want, we wanted to be, we want BGG to be a place that you can 
come and share your opinions and thoughts without fear or intimidation. And that's, I think we're getting there. And do you think that's essentially what BGG is now? It's it's a community rather than, because, because if I was to explain BGG to people, I would say, well, it's this big database of board games where you can look up every board game. But that's not entirely what I use it for. I, I use it to interact with people from the podcast. I, I read people's daily blogs. I've, I've met people through BGG. Is that what it is now? It's essentially a community. I think so. That That's, like I said, it was originally the goal was like to be the definitive board game resource, right? And that's the goal. But the community that has grown up around it, we want it to be a healthy one, right? For people that are like you that there's some people who are just like, I just use it to look up stuff and just look at pictures. I'm like, okay, cool. That's good. Do it. But definitely like, you know, a user like you interacting with people, I want that to be as healthy as possible. So it's sort of kind of a double thing, right? It's trying to be two things. So hopefully we accomplish that. Like if you get, if you get insulted every day, like, why am I, why am I bothering with this? Right? Like if I, if I get insulted every day by somebody, like that's not fun. That's not, good internet in my opinion so yeah i mean it's it's definitely and fundamentally uh, fundamentally games are about bringing people together exactly this is what i mean it's transformed my life just from my stories right um getting into gaming to change my life or for that that's come to this right so i'm i want everybody to have that experience so i want to ask you something now and um i i wouldn't be gauche enough to ask for figures or anything but so uh, last year Round about December, I put a tweet up and I said, hey, everyone needs to go over to Board Game Geek and they need to contribute to the fundraiser because Board Game Geek is the center of the hobby and it's the most valuable website I've ever experienced. And I'm, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. I, I really believe this is true. And I got a huge response that I really didn't expect from people saying, they don't need our money. It's a commercial venture. They've got all this media and they've got all of these people and they run the adverts. And screw them, I'm not giving them any money. So, and I was really surprised. So my question is, to what degree do you rely on community funding? And and does the website stop if people don't contribute? Good question. I didn't realize you got such blowback. Uh, see, that's Twitter for you. <laughs> uh, the fundraiser is important to us. Definitely, we don't. We wouldn't do certain things. Now, would the would the sh- would it shut down? Probably not. But it would be uh, like cutting off an arm. Let's say, right? Like, oh okay, yeah, well, we're not doing that anymore. We can't. We can't afford that. Um. So, yeah, and and honestly, the the fundraiser. It's one of those things that's like. Asking for money, I I always am struggling with it every year, right? Like, how do people, like, do you, f- basically what we're asking people is like, if you find some value in way the way you use, and this is, you know, it's obviously non-obligatory, right? You can not, you can choose not to. And people support in different ways, right? Like either through financial or through contributions, right? Like through uploading pictures or uploading videos or talking about games, blogging about games, writing a review. All those things are co- totally cool. Like that's the way BGG runs, right? It's user driven and including some financial support. So, um, you know, it's, and as we go forward, things get harder, right? Like there are more competition out there. Like people's money goes to a lot of things, right? So if you feel like that is worth your time and money, we ask for it. We don't demand it. It's just a thing, but yeah, it would, it would hurt if it stopped. And that's why we've kept doing it. Right. It's like, and people want to give it to us. Like I get questions like, how can I support? Oh, here's the link. Right. Like definitely. And I think, I don't know the the Twitter versus cruel. Like uh, you, you're going to get no punches pulled there. I mean, I think, I think, People, someone said, well, they hire all these media people and they pay all these media people. Why should we pay for that? How did you decide to go into the media sphere to hire Rodney and the Brothers Murph and do game night and that sort of stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's just one of those kind of like, we've always been sort of opinionless and faceless. And I sort of wanted to create a, because when you don't have an identity, for a company slash website, it's defined by other people, right? Like board game geek. I've always, people are like, you know, a lot of people compared us to Google, 
Google's a billion dollar company, right? Multi, multi billion. Amazon's a multi billion. Like we get compared to that. And I'm like, wow, that's the way people think of us instead of like a group of people who love games. Like that's what we are, right? And we're trying to do it online. So I wanted to basically say, this is who we are. This is our identity. We do streaming. We do game night. We do uh, fun stuff. We want to share the show that this, the industry or sorry, the hobby is a fun one and welcoming. That's sort of why the media has been created, right? Otherwise it's just, who are we, <laughs> right? Like what is board game geek? I don't know. It's a company. Oh, okay. Well, they don't need my money. It's a, it's a, a corporation. <laughs> like, okay, well, it's a pretty small one comparatively to one thing to the things you're being compared to. And, and how, to what it, when you've been getting the feedback, to what extent do you think you've succeeded in that? Oh, it's been super positive. Like people, um, so I think a lot of people in this that want to partake this don't have some of the things we've we've got, right? A lot of people can't go to conventions. A lot of people don't have weekly game groups. They'll play games like a couple times a year. So I'm hope like we just want to share that experience, right? Through video, talking about it, you know, posting news and stuff and all that information um, and convention coverage. So it's been very positive. Like a lot of people say, thanks for doing this. I couldn't go to Gen Con this year, but I watched the stream the whole time and I felt like I was there, you know, that kind of thing. So that's sort of the, the drive of it. So your next game then is uh, Settlers of Catan, but Settlers of Catan Citizen Knights. So I've not played this. Of course I've played Settlers, but I've not played this. What does this bring to Settlers? Oh, so much more. <laughs> I think if people played Cities and Knights their first go, they would not be so dismissive of Settlers, right? Like cities and nights brings in so much extra stuff that it's almost overwhelming. Like that's why people don't play it first. It's got a lot of what Chrome. Um, and that's what, that's when I started playing settlers, I played it a lot. Believe me, I, I love settler. I still play it. But when I started playing cities and nights, I'm like, Oh wow. Now this is like, a, like there's way more things to think about. So it gives you that settlers feel. Uh, it's obviously still driven by the dice. It's not, that's not changed, but there's so many more little things to do, right? Like there's, barbarians are going to come and knock down your wall city. Whoever has the, the, the weakest city gets destroyed. And there's so many, like there's more, there's more resources, like high, more technology to build. And there's also more uh, interaction in the game. So that's why I like, I prefer cities and nights to just regular settlers. And I think that if people played that one first, it wouldn't be so, I, I don't know. It's weird. Like everybody, when we, when, when, when we got into gaming, I mean, me personally, City settlers was the shit. <laughs> can I curse on this podcast? You can believe that if you do. Um, it was you like, certainly oh, can, yeah. okay. <laughs> like we were like, Oh my God, that was the, that was so great. Like, cause you just didn't have anything, but obviously now today we've got so many choices. We've got so many more better games, theoretically, uh, you know, by people's opinions. Um, settlers has a hard time. Uh, but cities and nights is really interesting to me. So I, that's the one I picked it. Plus it defined it. it I, I didn't mention this when I get in the gaming, when I, when I got settlers, I stayed up all night playing it with the guys, right? We were like hooked and that was like, Oh, I got to see what else is out there. <laughs> right. That it changed my life. You know, we've, we've spoke about Kanitia and how important Kanitia is, but do you think the modern hobby, especially the modern Euro game hobby, is built on the shoulders of settlers of Qatar? Probably some of them. Yeah, probably some things. I think it's sort of showed that you don't just have to roll dice to move, right? Roll and move kind of games. Like, oh, the, it generates resources. That's a different way of thinking. It, it makes people think differently. Like, as soon as you have those paradigm shifts, that's like what transforms things, right? Like, and that transformed, at least for me in my mind, gaming. Um, and the trading part, like there's a little negotiation in uh, Monopoly, I think, like, I think you can trade. I can't remember if that's in the rules. <laughs> it's been a while since I played Monopoly, but I think if people forget about that part of the game and this is front and center, right? You got to trade and trade well to win or do, you know, give you an edge. Um, and I think that just kind of makes people think differently. And when you think differently, like, oh, what if we did that? Like, it opens up barriers, right? Like, you think, oh, we could never have this part of a game. It'd be a game, but, well, Settlers did it. Okay, well, now I can make a game with that kind of thing. So definitely, um, definitely has changed the world. <laughs> so I want to talk now about the future. So what's what can we expect to see from BGG in the next sort of, Two years, five years, 10 years. Yeah. Well, we have lots of plans. Um, 
there's um, the, the biggest problem uh, we're trying to tackle now is the UI. And I think a lot of people will agree. BGG is not the most prettiest website or the easiest to use. And we've got a lot of legacy. Now we've been doing this over the past few years. Initially, we thought we have to redesign it all in once and overnight turn it on. But that has been super challenging and we just abandoned that. So instead, we've been doing it piecemeal. So if you're following along, you've been noticing things change and evolve like by parts that sort of gives this weird, like, why is it broken on the, you know, like people are like, why is it do this on that page? But this on the other, we're like, well, we're trying to do it in stages. Right. Um, so that is our biggest challenge right now. It's just redesign. And like I said, we've hired a full-time person um, and he's been now, it, I think he's been here for two years <laughs> working on this, um, doing each part separately. The front page is going to change very soon. Right, so you have a scoop. Uh, that's coming within, I, I want to say a month, but I'm always cautious on giving times because it always never works. Um, and it's, it's an interesting change because right now board game geeks front page is all automatic autom- or, um, uh, algorithmically driven, not a, and, and, and in no real, it's not a very, um, complex algorithm. It's just basically whoever thumbed the most stuff, hot, hot stuff fr- goes to the front the new one will be more interactive with your profile. So at least that's the goal, uh, based on your games that you, you look at and you play and you rate, um, will evolve your front page. Um, and so you'll have this sort of stream of gaming information come across and you can just scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and get more information. So that's a big change. There will also be a lot more edit editorialized content, right? Like we can, we can highlight things. We can create, structures of uh games or information based on one person's editorial right like all these pics of the games are for 2020 right like that kind of stuff um and it'll be like a little module on the page that's a lot different than what it is now right we just have the only really way we have control over board game geek right now is the news section we can post things and we can pin messages to the front page so this will give us a lot more flexibility and creativity of making new things um that has been evolving. We're still trying to add more video content. Like we still have gaps. Like there'll be, I, my goal for the video is to have a, a, a new video every day of the week, Monday through Friday. That's challenging because <laughs> it's a hard thing to make video. Uh, at least a video people want to watch, right? The conventions we're we're starting to go into the virtual convention. We announced the virtual BGG spring since BGG spring was canceled. We want some event that basically highlights playing games. So that's coming soon. So that might change, you know, depending on how successful that is, maybe we'll start doing virtual conventions, you know, annually or, or more often. Um, and we're also going to be doing, um, and this is basically, you know, coronavirus inspired. We weren't, we weren't really changing that much pattern this year with going to conventions. In fact, we had already gone to four before this happened. Um, we're going to do virtual, not virtual, but, uh, live streaming of like 18 games that are available to purchase right now. And the publishers will come on and do the demo online. So they'll be on their webcam. We'll be at our studio with the game sitting on the table and we'll demo it. So that's a new thing. Um, And we're always looking for more stuff. Like there's so many like things that people wish for, like a wish list of features. Like I would love to do all that stuff. It's just challenging with a small team, right? Like what do we focus on? So I would love to do all the little things that people have always wished for, but you know, it it takes time and money programming so on that then how many people does bgg currently employ and how many do you sort of envisage it growing to or is it grown to its maximum size do you think it's a good question um so i did a count the other day it's like 20 paid people some of them are employees some of them are contractors so it went from two to 20 over 20 years um we had a retreat at the beginning of the year and this was this is everybody who's like part of the team right like the the core there's so many admins and and like volunteers. There's hundreds of them. And so when you look, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if being in the center of it, you realize sort of how important BGG is to gaming. I was thinking about this today, and I can't think of any other hobby in which there is one place that is the central hub of the hobby in the way that BGG is. When you sort of think about that, how does that make you feel? Hmm. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I mean, excited and happy, right? I mean, I, 
we get a lot of criticism, I guess, being that central hub. Uh, so I sort of kind of sometimes get myself down on that. Like, why am I bothering with this? Right. But at the end of the day, like I have to look past that and be happy that we are here. I mean, I'm that's super lucky, right? Like there's so much stuff now these days on the internet, um, to have that title that you just gave us. That's all. I mean, I, I'm happy, excited, uh, overwhelmed, right? Like that's a big responsibility. Like, everything we do is, is watched and, and analyzed. Like if we, hopefully we don't screw up <laughs> that kind of, like the pressure is high. Um, all of those things. And so I've got one, I've got one question for you. So I went on BGG when I was preparing for this interview and I, I went to the designers section and I typed your name in to just see if you'd ever designed a game. Cause some oft cause every gamer, has thought about designing a game, whether they have or not. Why haven't you designed a game? And do you think you will in the future? Why haven't I? I don't know. I mean, I guess I've just never... I can certainly criticize and analyze games, though. I, I've never wanted to make one. I don't know. It just has never felt like... You know how you feel like, oh, I want to do that like someday or something? It's just ha- I just don't have that in me, right? It's not a spark. It's not a... There's no, there's no passion there to that, to do that. Um, will I ever, I mean, I've, I've thought about like, uh, most recently, like what would be a fun solo game to play? Like in this time of like not being able to go out and, and hang out and do stuff. Right. And I've started playing a lot of solo games. I'm like, Oh, I wonder if I, do I have that in me? Like, do I, do I have an idea that I could figure out? And then it went away. (laughs) Like I think about real five minutes in the shower, like, Oh, it's gone. Like, oh, I got to I gotta go do something else, right? Like, it's so, it's not, I don't know. It's just, you know, some people aren't, it just doesn't, it, I know a lot of gamers definitely feel that way. Like, I talked to all my group and one of the guys is actually a designer and one of the other guys is like, I got this design in my mind. And then the other guy's like, yeah, I've thought about it. <laughs> like me, I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't care. But um, yeah, no, I don't know. I, I It's a, one of those questions, like, how is it not there? I, I mean, in video game, when I worked in video games, I was making game type decisions um so it's in me right like in the video game world um but not in the physical board game world (laughs) it's it's super hard by the way and i get bored quickly i think that might be it and i i play tested a buddy's game he's been developing it for years right and every like six to eight months he brings it out and he's like oh we gonna play this again yeah like I know that a lot of good, great games, the great ones have been play tested to death. And I feel I would just get bored with that. I get, I I have a very fleeting interest type thing, right? Like, Oh, I'm into this for a week and I switch to something else, you know, very quickly. So maybe that's part of the problem. So your last game then is times up. Why is this the best party game? I've had the best times with that game. It's so emergent. Like you get these types of things that happen that are just so I've laughed so hard and had the best times with people like with that game. Um, Hopefully the cabin's got some friends there. (laughs) That would be important too. But uh, yeah, like it just, it is the perfect party game. Now I've played a lot of great party games, like just one and things like that. But, but, Time's up is endless, right? Like you have the cards, but you could bank up your own. It, it came from a, a parlor game where people just made up stuff. Uh, and so that's, and that, it just, just my experience with it. And it was one of the games that I think had been out since the beginning, right? Since, since I got into this stuff. Um, I remember playing at a convention I went to in 2000. It was just like the best time uh, being goofy and just having a good time. And, and do you think that's really the essence of gaming, those moments. And I guess this is very poignant at the moment because we're recording during the COVID crisis. Those moments of just feeling like you're in a room and everyone's together and you're rolling around laughing just as a group of people, as a community. Yeah. I don't, yeah, it's, board games are just a medium, right? Like to get together and play with friends and and even not friends sometimes, right? Like you can, most of my friends I met through gaming, <laughs> like I've sat down at a table, played a game and we're lifelong friends now. Hey, we're friends through this ga- board gaming medium. And that's, what's exciting about it. Like it's always, and, and the variety of things that come out, make it 
the medium not stale, right? Like if we were all just playing the same games over the year, I imagine it wouldn't be so exciting. Um, yeah, no, I think the media, board games are the medium. It's really the people that matter. That's that's what it boils down to. So I've got one last question then. So you're you're heading out of Dallas, heading down the road to flee the apocalypse. You go around a corner. The back seat of the car flies open. Four of the games go flying out down a ravine into a river and are swept away to eternity. Which game do you hope is sitting on the back seat of the car? What a disaster. Oh, my gosh. Um, golly, what would it be? I guess it would have to be Time's Up, <laughs> right? Like all the strategy stuff and those experiences, they're not as memorable, right? I remember the games at Time's Up. So I'll pick times up. Fabulous. So if people want to get hold of you, see what you're up to, tell yeah. you how wonderful Board Game Geek is, how would they go about doing that? I'm a Facebook person, but I don't really... I I guess the email would be the best way, honestly. Aldi, A-L-D-I-E, at BoardGameGeek.com. You can write me. You can geek mail me on BGG. I'm username Aldi. That, w- that works too. Uh, if you don't feel like email. I, email is a little bit rough for me. I do read all my geek mail, even though it says I have 17,000 unread messages. I read them through email. <laughs> um, the uh, Yeah, we're at Twitter. I'm, I'm Aldi on Twitter. We do post a lot on the Board Game Geek channel, uh, Twitter channel, uh, Board Game Geek TV on Twitch. That's There's a lot of me on there lately. We've, we've been doing live streams. So yeah, there's, there's a few ways. Brilliant. Well, Scott Alden, thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. It's been awesome talking to you. You can support the show in many ways. You can tell your friends. You can talk about it on social media. You can talk about it in your own blog, podcast, or video. Or you can support it directly by going to patreon.com forward slash 5G for D for a rolling donation or a one-off donation by hitting the PayPal link at the bottom of the website 5gamesfordoomsday.com. It's these donations that keep the show going. Also... If you want to say something nice about the show, or if you want to say something horrible about the show, you can contact me on Twitter at 5gamesfordoomsday, or send me an email at 5gamesfordoomsday at gmail.com. And if I've managed to haul my carcass away from the land-based ice cream sandwiches and the maximum overdrive made reality, I'll see you in two weeks for another 5 Games for Doomsday.